welcome everyone. Really delighted um, for you all to join us with the incredible panel we have uh, with us today um, for this session on basic income. Uh, really an, an introduction to help us all understand more about what basic income is, what it isn't, all the arguments, pros, cons and otherwise. Um, it just seems like it's uh, something that's getting more and more coverage in um, politically and in the media and, and it's important for us to understand much more about it and we have an absolutely incredible uh, panel with us today. I'm Barb Jacobson, I'm coordinator of Basic Income UK, uh, which is a national campaigning group um, and we've been uh, the last sort of since the crisis started we've been um, organizing with a lot of local groups in the UK uh, for an emergency basic income and that's now sort of turned into a, a recovery basic income uh, demand. So uh, it's been very exciting. Uh, a bunch of, of new local groups have popped up in the meantime and under the uh, UBI Lab Network. Um, and we're also working with uh, another group called the Basic Income Conversation, which is new and uh, Citizens Basic Income Trust. So it's Basic Income UK, UBI Lab Network, and the Basic Income Conversation, which are the main groups uh, working on this. Um, but we also rely very heavily on the, on the research and expertise of the Citizens Basic Income Trust, which has been going since 1986. I am a, um, a, founder, a founding director of World Basic Income. So we are, um, along with Paul Harnett, who you can also see, um, we run uh, an organization that campaigns to take the basic income idea to the global level as well. So we, we're huge supporters of national basic incomes provided by governments. I can't wait to receive mine. Um, that will be a huge help. Um, but we also um, believe that, that we need a mechanism to, to redistribute wealth um, from the rich of the world to everybody in the world. Um, that there's, there's the huge injustice of worldwide poverty that still exists and the direct cash transfers to everybody um, is what we deserve, it's what we need. It has the potential to contribute um, to solving a huge amount of um, social problems. And then depending how you fund it, it has the potential to help solve climate change um, and other ecological problems as well. So that our organization is called World Basic Income. We set it up a few years ago um, and uh, it's great to be here talking to you all. Uh, my name is Sarat Davala. I am uh, the coordinator of India Network for Basic Income and also the vice chair of Basic Income Earth Network. Um, I'm a sociologist by training and I was involved, I've been working with uh, Women's Trade Union and several civil society organizations the last 20, more than 20 years. Um, I was part of the, uh, the research team that did the um, MP uh, basic income pilot in India, in Madhya Pradesh in India. And uh, subsequently we did a follow-up study and then we set up a network, India Network for Basic Income, which um, actually um, was instrumental in bringing about the debate in India. And in 2017, it was also at the government level in India and at the political party level, I think there was a lot of discussion in the last elections also basic income was on the agenda. Um, so uh, now, right now, after COVID, uh, we seem to have developed an amnesia about all our history. Now we are completely involved in relief work because um, the informal sector workers and the migrant workers are really, really in a bad situation. And the lockdown, we have forgotten about COVID also. It's more the lockdown that has created such a huge um, uh, problem. So uh, at the moment, we are doing both uh, um, relief work in terms of uh, dry, give, providing dry, dry rations to people and also emergency basic income. And by collaborating with the postal department so that it reaches even those people who do not have the proper, so-called proper documentation. So that's it. That's what uh, I'm at the moment involved in. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Caroline. I'm based in Nairobi. I work for Give Directly here in Kenya, but have responsibilities across Africa for seven countries. Um, I have a background as a development communication specialist. And uh, for many years now, I have been working as um, an advocacy specialist for different kinds of issues. And recently when I joined Give Directly, I joined in as director 
uh, field director for basic income pilot that was launched here in Kenya and have since transitioned and currently my position is uh, director of recipients advocacy. So basically anything that's uh, in the interest of the people is my interest. And that's why I'm here with all these lovely people. Thanks, Laura, for incorporating me in the World Basic Income, where I sit as one of the advisory uh, uh, board members of the World Basic Income um, uh, Fraternity. Um, at Give Directly, in terms, of, in terms of basic income, what would I say? Not so different from what Sarah is saying. And now we are more scared about what is going to be happening to people beyond COVID. And uh, I'm more concerned about livelihoods livelihood messes that, um, you know, we are seeing the realities, especially in urban informal settlements and now creeping into rural areas, people losing jobs, um, jobs as w things we took for granted as women washing clothes for better to do households and earning an income for their, house, for their households are now not available. Men working in construction sites now cannot work. And while we thought that those might have been dirty and insignificant um, you know, sources of income, it's now just teaching us how badly it is to the economy and to the livelihoods of people. People are uh, like pretty much uh, uh, imminently going to be facing hunger and if we are not careful, even death. And governments may not be able to control it if they don't start addressing it right now. Uh, as give directly, we may not be we may not have the bandwidth to lift everyone into our arms and to carry on a full basic income that can go uh, a long way, but we are committed to the dream of a basic income. And for Kenya, what we have done currently is launched a program that is initially going to be reaching 50,000 people with $30 per month. And we started it in April and we continue to fundraise for it. Hopefully this can be sustained. Uh, we are also doing this in Malawi, in Uganda, uh, hopefully, we are also going to be activating Guinea. So, um, looking forward to updating you all on how this is going. The Guinea program is likely going to be a really big program supported by the government of Guinea. So, to stay tuned for updates. Hi, everybody. I'm also a founder of World Basic Income. Um, I've spent nearly all my adult life in development, international development. I've worked extensively in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Um, I'm an economist and just over 20 years ago I gave out some money, not a basic income, just a one-off to people in Malawi and I could track exactly what they did with it and they were brilliant. They all spent it wisely and ever since my thought has always been the solution to poverty is give them the cash. That's me. <laughs> I'm, uh, my name is Julio, I'm from Guatemala. I'm uh, now based in Berlin. I am part of the Basic Income Math Network, currently doing social outreach work. I am an economic anthropologist, and currently I'm working on a project here in Berlin which tries to sort of think about the relationship between anarchism and basic income. So how can we bring or about the basic income from below, from the bottom up? We're usually always waiting for politicians to give us a basic income, and we're arguing for it in all these policy discussions, in, in Berlin, what we're trying to organize is a set of relationships of, of, of trust, of, of complementarity between different, between different people to say, how can we communalize the wealth around us and give ourselves a basic income? So that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment. In my view, I think um, a universal basic income is actually the next level uh, in our democratic journey. Uh, and also a more civilized society. Uh, I think we need to take that leap, and I think that the, we are gaining that momentum in that direction. Basic income is actually, all of us know that it's, uh, it has five important characteristics. It is universal, it is individual, it is cash only, it's periodic, which is monthly, and most important, the real cutting edge of the basic income concept is it's unconditional. Unconditional, we have always reserved it for our family and for my wife and my child, my grandchild and my blah, blah, blah. We have restricted, we are capable of unconditionality, un unconditional love. 
but we have restricted it only to my family, to the private domain. But I think now we have to extract it and bring it to the public square and say everybody, everybody deserves unconditional love. It is that vision that uh, basic income uh, basic income carries. That is the, it gives a solid ground for everybody to stand on and then participate in the labor market. It is, uh, it is, it is, uh, it is, um, it is, it is not against capitalism. It is a capitalism where you don't start from zero. And any, any colleagues like to add to that? It's really important that it's the individual, you know, that it goes to individuals. Um, and that's certainly one of the things that very much attracted me to the idea. Um, I've got a background in uh, feminist campaigning and particularly in the need that, for women to have their own money. Um, you know, particularly in relation to, you know, things that happen in the family, the fact that, you know, it may be a wealthy family, but not everybody gets the same amount. Uh, the, the kind of position that women are in, uh, in terms of domestic violence and being able to escape. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's been my, my personal interest in it, but I think it's also extremely important to emphasize that it does go to individuals and it's not done on a, on a household basis. Mm -hmm. Following on from what Barb said, it's so, it's so important to have it to the individual. But in world basic income, we've always argued that children should receive it as well. And that ordinarily, the basic income to each child should go to the mother. I know that gets complicated if you're an orphan, etc. But there are mechanisms, guardians, etc. So that's, that's the kind of you know, should it go to the child or not? Or should the child get half a basic income or, or whatever? Those are discussions that are going on around the basic income movement, but we say it should go to the child as well as the adult. For those who are not too fond of capitalism, and I count myself in that number, um, basic income has the amazing ability to, as Sarah says, uh, you know, function perfectly well within capitalism, but also it, it's fundamentally a, a socialist or a you know, an e equality focused um, initiative that, that would work well in kind of any political system. It's certainly not based on an idea of economic growth um, or, or on an idea of wealth concentration for the rich. So, uh, it, it, you know, you, you can come to it whatever your political persuasion, but I think you're most likely to, uh, to like it best if you're somebody who, who prefers um, a level of equality and dignity. I think one other important thing about basic income is the space it opens for civic participation because it gives voice to the voiceless. Mm. Uh, that people start viewing the world as an equal world, an equal space where everyone has a space to be considered as human. It, it basically, basic income humanizes human beings one more time. It gives, it gives people choice and it empowers people who hitherto remained disempowered and may not have been heard forever. And this is something that, you know, it's just as practical and as simple as just give that, that money to the people and you will hear them speak. People will talk about peace. People will talk about democracy. People will talk about the concern of leaders just because they feel somebody cares about them. That is what basic income is all about. Basically, we've got enough money in the world. So getting hold of the money shouldn't be a problem unfortunately a lot of it is with very very rich people but if we reformed our tax systems if we if we um tax some of the bad practices that are going on around the world at the moment there'd be plenty of money to give give a basic income to everybody in the world how would you get it to them um well caroline caroline knows this as, as much as anybody because in in Africa there's a mobile banking system and that is not over the internet that is using an old Nokia where you can actually transfer cash you can walk up to a table and transfer 15 50,000 shillings to the person behind the table on the on your phone and they give you the cash so and there are other methods of transferring cash um, ID is a bit of a problem, but again, we have the technology to ensure that we have ideas. Sarath knows in India that the coverage, the, the biometric ID covers 
let's say 98, 99% of the population. It could be improved, there's a few holes in it, but so we have the cash, we have the technology, we just don't have political will. We're not looking after our people. That is, that is the blockage. So it, it can work. And Caroline's absolutely the best person to talk about this. She's, she's giving out the basic income to 60,000 people. <laughs> like Paul is saying right there, a lot, of, a lot of countries, if they had political goodwill, would be able to you know, lift a basic income even as a shore of goodwill to its people. Because uh, I like to tell the story of basic income with the realities of people's lives. And one example that happened this week in Kenya is a poor woman, a widow whose her husband died last year, last week was literally cooking stones to while away time for her children to go to sleep. That type of a person should never be let live that type of a life. And no government can say that they do not have enough to reach those kind of people. That goodwill is what creates momentum for a basic income. Because once we see 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, 1 million people benefiting from that, a basic income, then we create the momentum that can reach everybody in the whole country. It doesn't matter how remote you are. It doesn't matter how poor you are or how unintelligent you are. A basic income can be given by as simple as a two SMS touch point with a recipient just to confirm they, that they actually exist and they have a mobile money wallet and that money hits their account. And you can't believe it. Some people may say that, you know, if you give them money, they will waste it. They will drink it away. And I stopped to ask, how much is wasted by our government? How much is just lost that can just be used to help hundreds of thousands of people who are suffering? And how paternalistic can people get to make a decision about people who are on the verge of dying? To decide that when you get money, you'd rather drink alcohol rather than eat it. And how paternalistic it would be for people to imagine that if you're extremely poor, that you can actually not withdraw money from a mobile wa money wallet and bring it home with livelihood benefits to your family. We have seen that all this are lies. It is possible. Governments here in Africa have tried to do um, you know, something that could be akin to what we are looking at as a basic income model, which is targeting population segments. Giving money to old persons, orphans and vulnerable children, people living with disabilities, people living in hunger-stricken and famine-stricken environments. And they have seen that this actually works. If it does work, then I think it is time for the aid environment, government, political leaders, to see that there is potential in putting money in people's pockets so that people can have a better life. I just wanted to jump in on the how you pay for basic income. Um, so th there's really two models of basic income that are being discussed in this call. There's national basic income, which basically is, is funded by general taxation in most um, countries. That's the proposal for the UK. Um, a really good detailed um, proposal that, um, uh, that's been developed is the, the one in the Green Party's 2019 manifesto. Um, that tells you exactly how much people would get, how much it would cost, um, and then the, um, the total, uh, where, where the money would come from, comes from the, the last chapter. So that's in the Green Party's 2019 manifesto for a national model. Um, but for a global um, model, for a world basic income, um, we've spent the last few years developing some really detailed costings on this. Um, one of the biggest potential funding streams comes from an international carbon tax. So there's a lot of good reasons why we think carbon tax should be international, not least that you don't want the most polluting countries to get the biggest revenues from carbon tax and the least polluting countries to get nothing. Um, that's deeply un unjust. Um, so an international carbon tax with the money put in a, in a sovereign wealth fund, so a, basically a fund of money owned by the people of the world, that could then be invested in positive things like renewable energy infrastructure. So you essentially have you know, wind turbines owned by the people of the world. And then the revenues that comes from that um, goes into a pot and gets distributed. So that's one mechanism. 
and we propose a lot of other mechanisms as well. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of detailed work gone into the funding of these things and then um, and, and into every other element as well. So Caroline's talked about how the money is distributed. Um, there's various proposals for how you make sure that you, you get people individually identified. There's, um, you know, biometric methods, there's digital methods like Bright ID. So there's, there's really no practical barriers to this. And there's a lot of detailed work if you look, um, if you go looking for it. Uh, there are two, three key issues here, um, Zoe. I think one is that um, delivery of cash. This doesn't apply to Europe and the United States, but I think it applies a lot to Asian countries and African countries. Can you actually, can you actually fix the last mile? I completely agree with what Paul has said that I think it is possible. We have the money. We also can. We, if we can send a satellite into the space, into Mars, or to somewhere else, we can send wretched money to that last man. And we have shown during the COVID times, uh, government gave some cash to the regular people who have the biometric system and are part of the food security program, which is one of the largest programs. But then they said for the migrant workers, by the way, migrant workers in my city are 20% of the population. Mm. So they're not small. So they have always been there, but we never saw them. We never realized that there are so many, like after the flood, all the ants come out of the earth. They all came out of the earth, which means the reality has always been there, but this comes and puts a magnifying glass on what our life is like, what our society is like, what the inequalities are like. So it is possible. Then we said that we, we, we can, we can give even the migrant workers. So we did a pilot here and we said, here is 100 uh, names and here is here the, the phone mobile numbers. We went to the postmaster general and we said that, can you deliver this cash through your money order system? And you charge your 2%, whatever, we will pay that. And the next day post office went four postmen went to those hundred people and handed over money. I mean, I mean, it, it, it doesn't take, it is not rocket science at all. So the, there is lack of political will. I mean, governments would love to say that we want to do it, but it's not possible. We want to show, our job is to show that it is possible. Mm -hmm. Now the question is that, does it work? Does it really work? When the money reaches the people, there are a huge set of myths saying that they will drink it away is the first thing. And then they will waste the money. They don't know how to plan, blah, 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 and all that. I think these are all the, the middle class and the chattering classes and the other classes are saturated with these lovely prejudices that those fellows can't manage their lives, whereas we can manage our lives. Okay, that kind of a notion is there. But I come from a pilot study where we lived in the village for two years and saw people what they do when they get money for 18 months. We sat with them, we stayed in the village, we saw what they did. I'll tell you what they did. They started planning their life in a very different way. They did not make any radical shifts in their employment, radical shifts in their food. It's an, just a mild choice a slight change of a different choice. From an exploitative borrower, money lender, they move to a soft source of borrowing money. From an exploitative employer, if they have a choice, they move to somebody who doesn't exploit them. They make those choices. Your, their agency comes to the fore. So my conviction today doesn't come from my academic reading. My conviction comes from looking at people, what they do, what they did in our program. And even now when we are giving, we are looking at people. We are sitting with people to understand what they do with money. It's extremely important. Governments would like to look at people poor, particularly as animals in the zoo. They just need rice. So you give them rice. You have a grand $30 billion food security program and say, this is one of the world's greatest food security program. What about medicines? Where will they buy milk from? How will they pay their rent? 
what do you think of human beings do you think they're animals with due respect to animals so the, the whole point the whole point is we are constantly trying to pr prove that it works and i think more of us many more people all in pilots have to keep proving that yes it works it works it definitely works and we have to i would rather i would rather make a mistake by trusting people than make a mistake by mistrusting people i just wanted to make a couple points one is that i think it's important to keep um separate uh the idea of basic income or the you know the the principles of it and the, all the different policies okay so there's all different ideas out there about how to pay for it how much it is what you know what mechanism you use and stuff like that okay and i think sometimes critics get too focused on one particular policy that they don't like without actually dealing with the principle all right and uh leanne gale made a really good point in the chat box all right about you know that it's not so much about money it's about caring all right and the fact that a basic income really um you know really really reinforces the idea that we're all here to look out for each other i mean i think you know i've i've had uh, an ex a very uh, an xr person in my house for quite a while he's not here right now because of lockdown but you know what we were always arguing about you know he'd come back home with his hair on fire about about the carbon you know about the the um about about climate change and how this was affecting people and i'm also i i didn't say i was i I've, i've been a um, a welfare rights advisor and so i I'd, i'd have to be saying well look there are a lot of people who can't get through the next day all right and so extinction for them as carolyn was saying is an immediate problem all right it's not like something that's going to happen in two or three years time or 10 or pick a number okay it's something that's really immediate for people and i really think that you know a measure like basic income uh would make would free up a lot of people to care about the environment and each other all right rather than having to worry you know from one minute to the next where their where their food is coming from or where their rent is coming from or being on the streets we have to remember that all of the rights that we have came because of previous struggles of people that came before us and and this exactly in these times of crisis is a moment when we really have to push politicians into making a basic income happen um i think for for my for myself personally like i do not you know mostly in in politics people think that the plot of politics is to uh take uh, control of the state in order to change it from within but this shouldn't be the it this is a very limiting horizon of what politics actually is so when we talk about political will we also have political will we have the political will to ask and to say we want to democratize money we want to change the way in which money is produced we don't need central banks we don't need private banks we can issue money ourselves as a basic income you know we don't need we don't really need in theory we don't need all these states and governments to give it to ourselves if we claim the right to do this to give ourselves a basic income from below um it, it totally changes the political uh possibilities of, of what is you know what can you do as a, as a society as a community and so on uh, there's a couple of arguments i think sometimes basic income has got a reputation as um something to replace um working and paid work um i think that's personally i feel like that's a distraction from what this is really about like there is an argument for basic income based on or, or you know that the machines are going to take all our jobs in the end and i think it's important for us to be you know ready and responding to that kind of technological change but ultimately it's you, we're not suggesting that you have a basic income instead of decent jobs good workers rights solid public services you know um fair wages all of those things are also essential but we don't have to pick and choose you know no one suggests you know when you call for more funding for healthcare no one suggests that you you don't also care about education for instance mm. we assume that it's possible to to properly fund both healthcare and education and we demand that our governments do that and in the same way we demand that um you know that we receive a basic income um and also receive proper workers rights a fair wage you know efforts to 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 make the economy produce decent jobs for us there's no reason why we can't have all of these things so i think um that's one argument that comes against basic income from the left but to me um 
to me it's a real dud it's it, it you know we don't we don't need to we don't need to choose which good things we have in life we can demand all of these things and they're not in competition with each other uh, there are moral arguments against basic income there are political there are economic arguments there are a wide variety of arguments that we hear and we have to constantly address those the the the, the critique now moral argument is that when there is the whole uh, we have inherited the industrial work ethic that if you don't work you don't deserve to be paid um but again this is in the public domain not in the private domain you know uh, you don't uh, you give your children money you give your children education but you don't ask them to work for it isn't it so we have one rule there and we have a one another rule in the public square uh so uh, to say that um, to say that uh, uh, you should be paid a wage that you have to sell your labor in the market and only then you deserve so the welfare system is designed around uh, this idea either they pay you for your past labor or the current labor or the future labor that is where the investment is supposed to go i think that is going to change completely in the 21st century because we are not going to have that many jobs definitely but i think we we have the wealth that is the paradox of the 21st century that we have the wealth but doesn't matter so guy sanding makes a distinction between work and labor labor is what you sell in the market but you work is something that you can choose to do you can do care work you can do whatever work you like to do so that is one that's a moral ethical argument that no 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 you should not pay in fact i think one of our <clears throat> our own government statement said that would gandhi have approved uh, mahatma gandhi would have, have would we have approved uh, unconditional basic income he would have he wouldn't have so there's a huge debate about that now the political argument is that the state is going to give this cash and then run away from all its that's the left in india it's going to run away from all its responsibilities and then say that we have given you cash we have you don't ask us anything more i i will not give you the road you don't have a right to ask me for a road you you make your own road it's a very weak argument because you can't go to a priest and say padre i want to go to heaven but don't ask me to change anything about my life okay so I, i don't think you'll get a very good uh, response from the padre if you say that first thing is that padre will give you 10 things that you should not do and then 10 things that you should do so if we want a better world if we want a world an equitable world if we want a world where everybody has a basic ground to stand on if that is our goal vision you better change many things like i think a lot of us talking about carbon tax for example data people are stealing data from us and giving us nothing okay so the data is a new oil so several things we let's open all the account books how are you managing my commons okay so in the indian supreme court has given a, a, a given a, a verdict in response to a, an ngo filing that the state is only a trustee natural resources belong to people the commons belong to people so the owner of the natural resources has a right to ask the trustee the custodian how are you managing my money my resources i think let's open everything why do you want to very selectively open this and that and say that it's not possible let's open everything let's have a full talk on this just wanted to respond to zoe's question about who are the biggest oppositions to basic income and i think i'd love to look at it from two levels i'd love to i'd love to look at it from a macro level and from a micro level and these people do everything they can to counter the force of a basic income and at a macro level what they say is they want to start using uh national gdps and you know resource capabilities of countries to ask questions such as so can we afford it and as Paul has talked about it Sarah has talked about it Flora has also like given us insight it is possible it is a possibility and one thing that i can say here is we don't have to wait we don't have to wait for these policy makers to write down how possible this is 
and I will give, give the reason why this is so. Right now in Kenya, people have been opposing a basic income, tooth and nail. And the government has reached a point where they can do nothing to help the people except give the money. And don't ask me where they've gotten the money, but the government has committed about 30 billion Kenyan shillings to deliver in a basic income, to send it to the people. Guinea has committed money. As directly, we've had people talking to us from countries such as Senegal, from Ghana, and they're talking about what can we do to cushion our people. And right now, it, we are at a time when we cannot close our eyes to the possibilities of a basic income globally, because we are saying that we are with COVID-19 right now, we're going to create another big problem in terms of poverty. We are going to create a huge gap. Billions of people are going to slip, slide back into poverty. And when they slide back into poverty, we can't continue closing our ears. They are our problem. We can't watch people die. And we, governments are not going to say, you know what, we're going to create for them jobs. That may not be true. They have to find a quick solution to cushion these people. So that is at a high level. At a micro level, there are people who start dehumanizing poor people and start judging them as people who cannot make decisions, people who are going to drink. And as I have had, a, I've just seen a question here about economies are going to be flooded, you know, and questions that are basically paternalistic and hindering to the empowerment of poor people. Speaking about these issues is more really, especially from a person who is interacting with people who have been receiving this money. And one thing, there is no inflation or disruption of the economic equilibrium of economies, local economies for populations that are receiving a basic income. That is not true. And there is evidence to that effect. There is a study that has been done here in Kenya and it's evident that instead of, instead of the economies getting disrupted and inflation going up and prices increasing, we actually are seeing improved trade, improved income, even for people who don't receive the money. Do people actually stop working? Do they stop being productive? Guys, let's be real. A lot of times, people who sit on decision-making tables have never been down there to feel the pangs of poverty. We are talking about people who live a day as it comes. We have the luxury of having salaries and we can plan our lives a month out, a year out. You can plan to own a house. You can plan to eat good food in the next two weeks. We are talking about people who eat good food when it arrives. And when you give people a basic income, little as you may imagine that it is, people start planning their lives. People start getting in touch with the reality of what money can do. People start becoming hopeful. That in itself is a game changer. When you increase people's hopes, you increase their innovation. When you give people the ability to plan their lives a year after, I know I will receive $20, $30, $50. I can plan with the $50 I will receive in the next six months to do one or two things. Think about this. In communities, especially here in Africa, I like to talk about Africa because this is where my experience is. Here in Africa, a lot of communities are agricultural based. People deform, depend on farmlands to produce food and to produce income. When you don't have money to eat today, you will lose out your farm, the only source of income, the only source of livelihood. We have seen people who lose out their farms then they go and work on other people's farms and work for very little money, money that is even less than what we give as a basic income. And when you start giving them money, they claim back their farms. They start working on their farms. They don't work for people anymore. They have their own money. They, can, they have a starting point. And that makes the biggest difference. And I don't know when it will take government to sit down and just think about that. That when I don't go working on somebody's farm, I'm actually bringing innovation in the trigger of the national economy. We are bringing in new contributors to the national economy. And that is what we should be thinking about. How do we trigger our economy? Little money that we give through basic income have innovative ways, have powerful ways of triggering economies.
to even generate that money that governments are wondering, where are we going to get the money? Let's help our people to be co-producers of economic growth in our countries. Uh, just to say that, that, you know, in terms of, you know, like the, uh, the, the left, you know, kind of going about, well, we, we're going to lose services or we're going to have cuts to benefits or whatever. That's definitely a metropolitan uh, country idea for sure. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that under austerity, we've been fed this lie that there isn't enough money. Uh, when we, you know, money, and I think Julio would agree with this, that money is the one resource that humans create themselves, all right? And, you know, so therefore, you know, we've got to be able, you know, we've got to have a real think about how it's used um, and who it goes to, you know, and if you've got a whole bunch of, of um, company owners or whatever, and they're socking, I mean, you know, companies, large companies like Apple and Google, they are sitting on the largest cash piles ever. All right. And the most money that, you know, it's more money than a lot of countries' GDPs. All right. And I don't, you know, there has to be some way of dealing with that. Now, whether it's about actually requisitioning the money back or whether it's just saying, right, if your money's in a tax haven, it's not worth anything. So we're going to create some more money that people can use. Or if it, you know, another idea, which I, I really like is, um, you know, that you could have, you know, cities could create local currencies. And then if you can tax them back, you know, if the cities can then use that for business taxes or other, other sorts of, you know, that would kind of validate the money. And it would be, you know, it would make it possible to do pilots or to actually just create basic income within localities. So we don't have to wait for, you know, whole national governments or for the UN or whatever, all right, to actually start creating our own basic income. And, yeah, just to complement what you're saying, actually, this idea of making basic income through local currencies is already happening in places like Brazil. In Latin America, there is a lot of innovation going on with this. The city of Marica, in the, in the outskirts of Sao Paulo, has made for the last years what, uh, what they call a basic income on the city level through a currency called Mumbuka. And it's going, it's going really well, of course. It's backed by uh, some sort of sovereign fund and also by the, 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 the Brazilian national currency. And it works, of course it works. Why wouldn't it work? <laughs> uh, it's just, we're just locked in this imagination that we have to wait for politicians and central banks to give us this money. But we, like, you know, it's, it's as, as you said, Barb, you know, m money is a commons. It, we make it ourselves. This is the intuition that people have when they say, I make money. You know, you really are making it when you're working. But in practice, it's just a bunch of rent extraction. It comes from banks when they give you a loan, when you give you a debt. Uh, and also from central banks. And this is not natural. This is not how it should be. It's just a remnant of some archaic institution of the 17th century. And we must abolish it somehow. We need to like make it democratic and so on to like really, really uh, claim back power, decentralized power. You know, as the, as the Black Panthers in the, U in the US used to say, all the power to all the people. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm what other people have been saying basically and just put a bit in perspective. Is there enough money? The Fed in the United States has been doling out a trillion a day during this, this crisis. Now, Caroline is giving, let's say, $30 a month to 50,000 people in Kenya. If you translate that to everybody in the world, and I would include children, as I said before, um, if you did that to everyone in the world, that would cost you about 6.6 .6 trillion. There you are. There's the money. Plenty of it. Yeah, the Fed's just doling out money right, left and centre. So we haven't got the money. Absolutely not true. And it's all been revealed recently. It was revealed during the 2008 crisis as well. But um, this time to an even greater extent. And I'd just like to tell a little story. When I gave out money... 20 years ago, both the World Bank and the Malawi government were really against me doing it because they said that the, the men especially would drink it away. I tracked that money. I interviewed every single person, a thousand people that, that received that money. One person, just one, bought alcohol. He was a very old man. He had no family. And I interviewed him. And he said, 
yeah, I bought some seeds and I bought some alcohol and I'm planting my seeds and when I finish planting, I'm going to drink the rum. I said, okay. But he had no family. That was the key to it. And I think the point to be made here is that often we see poor people away from their communities, maybe down the mines or building roads all over the world. And those people are the people who at the end of the week might spend the money on alcohol or spend the money on gambling or whatever. But generally, whether you're a man or a woman, if you're living within your community and with your family, you do the, you do the right thing. And that has been proven. I do see it as a kind of stepping stone. Um, I think what people really discount with money is its symbolic value. Um, I don't think that if, you know, I don't think there's much hope of getting to a, an, an, a, a society where we don't need money until everybody has the same amount of money and can rely on it. Um, it's not so much, you know, for me, it's not so much about inequality, it's actually about insecurity. And if you want to, you know, trace the, the the problems that we have with politics at the moment is, is largely about insecurity and not so much about inequality. That people are really worried about where they're gonna get the food next or where they're gonna get the rent next, all right? And that actually closes their mind to new ideas. It makes the, you know people have a tendency then to blame somebody who's not actually responsible for their situation. Um, you know, basically because they're feeling fearful and insecure. I, of course, believe that it is a stepping stone uh, for a better world. And But what is that better world? I think uh, there are two important crises that we are uh, facing apart from the employment crisis that I don't want to go into that. There are two important crises that as a human, as a mankind, we are going through. One is um, um, and the ecological crisis, which all of us know, and the reasons also we know. And uh, there's also another crisis, the moral crisis, about the, what is the meaning of our existence? What is the meaning of our life? Is it more consumerism and more consumerism? And is that the goal of our life? So I think uh, basic, unconditional basic income immediately addresses the question of insecurity. And I think in the process, we should also have the objective of addressing certain pathologies that we have in our society. I think we have become a extremely, uh, we have fetishizing consumerism, consumer goods, consume more, consume more. I think better life is consume more. Have two cars instead of one, have two flats instead of one. Security means have two flats, blah, 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 and all that. I think, I think in the better world, that is not going to be bring us a sustainable uh, world and a sustainable life. I think we need to address some of these very serious pathologies of our society. And our, I think it's across the board. It's nothing about the first world, second world, third world, fourth world, fifth world, and sixth world. Not at all. I think across the board, we are getting into this kind of a thing. We need to address them squarely as part of moving towards that better world. There have been quite a few plans that have been put out there which are feasible. It really depends. You know, again, we've been discussing money again as this thing, you know, it's a resource that we all create, all right, or that is created on our behalf. And, um, you know, we know that there's no shortage of it, okay? I mean, we certainly, if we've learned nothing from the last few weeks, we've learned that there's no shortage of money. Um, there are plans, you know, and again, it's like, you know, we get mixed up with the taxes, all right? You know, the, one of the biggest lies over the last 40 years is that corporations should not have to pay as much tax, all right? So we've seen corporation tax go down. We've seen taxes on dividends. So we're talking about the taxes on unearned income that, that some people get with unearned income have gone down in the last 40 years, all right? And we get that mixed up income tax, all right, which most people work for, has, you know, relatively speaking, gone up. But now people get mixed up with taxes, all right? Any tax means income tax. No, 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 all right? We can have a lot of different other taxes on people's unearned income, which, you know, are certainly feasible. Um, the uh, Compass has been working on this. Stuart Lansley and Duncan McCann have done some work on sovereign 
uh, sovereign wealth, is it sovereign wealth funds? I can't remember what they call it, all right. But it's basically the equivalent of a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, uh, Yanis Varoufakis has proposed uh, that, that, you know, that the large corporations, that the governments have some kind of share. And I, you know, I get Julio's point, which is that, well, we can create this now locally. Um, on the other hand, we've also, you know, given over a lot of resources to the government. And that's why I still campaign politically for this, all right, because we need to also get our hands on those resources, all right, you know, yes, you know, let's do it on our own, or let's, let's let, you know, get localities like the one in Brazil do it, all right, you know, but there's, you know, there, there is a big claim that we have, you know, the unpaid work that we do, whether it's looking after ourselves or each other, or the environment, you know, all of those things, okay, we've got a big claim on, on the government. There's a really nice strap line from one of the congressional uh, candidates in New York, and he's talking about a, a, a basic income based on data. And, and his strap line is, we owe us, okay? We really owe us, all right? You know, we're already doing the work, all right? It's not about like, will we do the work in the future or will we work for, you know, that question is really about, well, will you work for an employer? What about the things that we wanna do, all right? which will benefit the people around us, make us happy, you know, have us, let us have less, less stress and more income security. And this, you know, again, this is, yeah, there's lots of plans. I mean, if you Google basic income UK, uh, you'll get a plan from the Royal Society of Arts. You can get a plan from, from Citizens Basic Income Trust. That's called a revenue, new, revenue neutral plan. And those plans, they don't question Okay, the current tax structure, and I think that's actually something that we need to do uh, very strongly going mm. forward. I think there's basically no amount of money that would be ineffectual. So uh, I'm sure um, Caroline and um, Sarath will would, you know, have examples of this. The, the basic income that was given in India was incredibly small um, in the pilot experiment. It was sort of only like two, three, up to five or ten dollars a month at the most um, per person. So, you know, and then in the UK, if you look at other benefits, like I received child benefit for my kid, for instance, it's, you know, it's only 20 pounds a week. So sort of 80 something pounds a month. Um, it's a really big help, you know, so there's no amount actually that would be too small, such as to make it a waste, it's never a waste. Um, I think the question is, you know, how much do people need for it to be a basic income that could reasonably, you know, give people a, a, a level of security if they're not in paid work as well? Um, you know, that's a difficult question. Um, people have often come to a figure of around mm -hmm. around £100 a month, assuming that housing benefit remains, um, has often been sort of floated as, as a kind of um, a, a basic minimum. In terms of whether you should um, not pay as much to rich people, there's, we've got a page on our website that, that answers this question of why, why pay it also to the rich. It's, it's a really good question and it's a, and it's a common one. There's, there's a number of reasons. Um, Number one is that if, well, number one is that you can just tax it straight back off them through various taxes. So it's easier to just give it to everybody because if, if you start um, not paying it to the rich, then everybody else has to demonstrate that they're not one of the rich. And then you've, you've invented a whole load of bureaucracy that has to go into the scheme and makes it much more complicated. So it's much easier to use the tax system, which already looks at who's rich and who's poor to just tax it off them and get it back that way. Um, Another good reason to give it to everybody um, equally is that if you look at systems like the NHS, where, you know, that's the National Health Service for anyone who's coming in from anywhere else, um, you know, everybody gets access to that. We don't suggest that people above a certain income level shouldn't get access to it. And, and one of the great things about that is it, it is so well defended by the population in a political sense. You know, the, if anyone ever threatens the NHS, even the Conservatives have to pretend that they care about the NHS. So it's, you know, it's, it's really useful to have something that's truly universal because then, um, you know, then it, uh, th then it goes to everybody. I think what's interesting about the current crisis is that now you've suddenly got a lot of people um, who previously have been earning good incomes um, now, on the now on benefits. Funnily enough, suddenly the government have increased universal credit by 20 pounds a week because they, they know that, it, that once, you know, once middle class people, you know, once lots of middle class people are receiving it, they won't consider this to be acceptable anymore. So, you know, having 
having people at all different income levels receiving something can help to bolster that system. Those of you who've looked at basic income in developed countries, it's often seen as a reform of the welfare system. And I, I think there's been hints in today's talk where basically we're not saying that. We don't want it to be as an alternative to welfare. We're saying that it's a right. Our commons have been taken off us. They owe us. We want that money back. And if it's a thousand pounds a week, fine. Give it to everyone in the world. So this isn't a solution to welfare. This is a right, a human right. I, it's really unfortunate that the universal basic services idea sort of came up, you know, was kind of invented as an alternative to basic income. And that's certainly not what most basic income advocates feel. All right. You know, the services, a lot of the services, especially the universal services are, are very much needed. Um, there are some really good ideas in the specific uh, UBS proposal that, that, that came out a couple years ago. Um, like say, for example, you know, free broad broadband and and access, you know, and, and definite access to housing, that sort of thing. Um, but I think again, you know, it's, I mean, I'm sure people in XR can appreciate this, that, you know, what we can get is very much dependent on how much power we have when we're making the demand. Okay, so if we're making a demand for both basic income and services, and, you know, and in some cases jobs, all right, because that's also a question, um, you know, we should be demanding all of that, all right, because, you know, that's, you know, of course, money is not going to solve everything, all right, but it's, but it will be a step along the way. Um, and, you know, and then the other problem, I mean, the problem with services, you know, also such as the, the specific proposal, and again, I'm talking to a specific proposal that was made by UCL a couple years ago, um, you know, certain things like food is really something very personal to people and they really should have a choice about it. I mean, this is the problem with the rise with food banks here is the fact that people, you know, not only is it very, does it feel very demeaning to go to a food bank, all right, but then the other thing is you have no choice over what you get, all right, and what you eat, which is one of the most fundamental things about a person is what you eat and making choices over that. You know, so that's where the services don't really, you know, in those sorts of things, that's where they don't really cut it. You know, it's not about trying to put in opposition, you know, healthcare, education and housing, which we all need to basic income. It's really about the power we have when we make the demand and, you know, and what we demand. And I think we, you know, need to demand all of it. I think it's very important to say that today the biggest threat to the ecology are private banks. This, this, these institutions are basically accelerating the level of entropy in the planet because this is where economic growth happens. All of the, all, all of the evils that sort of we are all up sort of uh, against start when a bank gives out a loan with a positive interest to people, to, to corporations, to bailing them out and so on. This just makes the extraction of the world's resources go at a faster rate. If we do not decentralize this, then there is no way we can get off... Uh, you know, uh, get off the path that is going towards the cliff. You know, this movement, like 10 years ago, people weren't talking about it. Um, now, loads of people are talking about it. You know, MPs, even some conservative MPs and lords um, in the UK are demanding this. So, you know, never doubt that this is making progress. It really is. And it's, it's not always easy to see how we contribute to it. But by continuing to talk about it, by having, you know, meetings like this, there will be some people on this call who are already the converted. There'll be some people who are the partially converted. There'll probably be some people that really didn't know much about this. Um, and, all, you know, that, that will go on and, you know, we need to all continue those conversations elsewhere. We need to invite more people into these conversations that, um, that don't already know about this. We need to take this discussion into forums let's say for instance this is an extinction rebellion meeting this is about environment it's not about income and yet here we are talking about universal basic income this is a new forum for us so it you know it really is spreading out and if you you know this is happening with xr north but you know i'm involved in a number of basic income 
sort of discussion groups and stuff. That stuff like this is happening all over the country, all over the world, um, especially at the moment, um, especially in response to the pandemic. There is loads going on. So I think the, the important things are, um, you know, take part in discussions, talk to people, you know, in, in person or, you know, remotely in person, um, take part in the social media discussion, share things, that's so useful. Um, you know, get things out there, make demands of your politicians, um, especially politicians that ought to be on our side. You know, the, the British Labour Party um, really should be supporting basic income by now and it's still on the fence. Um, it's not going to take too much more to tip them over. Loads of people within the Labour Party um, believe in this um, proposal. So it's not going to take much more and then hopefully, you know, surely they'll one day get elected to government again and then we could actually have this in the UK. Um, in terms of the global movement, we need to just start these conversations globally. We need to start talking about world basic income when we talk about um, issues like poverty, when we talk about inequality, when we talk about national basic income, we need to bring in the global angle. Um, but the in terms of organizing locally, that's another brilliant way. Just it keeps the energy going. It keeps the momentum and events happening. Um, and there's loads of groups that you will find by a simple Google. Um, so there's absolutely tons that we can do and people already are doing and it is working. In terms of building momentum for basic income, we have different approaches that um, uh, in addition to what Laura has said, building a bottom up approach, building pressure from below so that we have more people, the people who need a basic income are the people who need to have the voices to ask for the basic income. They know what it does to their lives. They know what changes it does. So we need to recruit more grassroots advocates of basic income to speak about either their experiences or what anticipated changes they hope to see with a basic income. As advocates of basic income, I see that we have a responsibility to position basic income as a responsibility of us all to make sure that humanity is given the humanity it deserves, that we care for the people for the care that they need, and that we position basic income as a human right, not an alternative. I'd love to see a world in which advocates for basic services, basic health, can see the reality of, you know, the fact that a basic income is just as good as basic services and that we are not coming in to replace basic services because we can never. Basic income will actually even go into some of those basic services. But what we are saying is, as we put a force for governments to put in basic services for its people, they must also respect the fact that having resources in your hands give you an, gives you an ability to make micro-level decisions that governments can never make for whole communities. That's a very important part of humanizing people, empowering people, and giving them a choice. And one example I can give is, there has been a lot of talk about universal health. There has been a lot of talk about universal edu basic education. In our countries, for example, in my country, we have universal basic education. But I will tell you, Parents need money in their pockets for these children to access even that universal basic education. Education is free, but there are things that parents still have to provide for their children. They have to provide food. They have to provide uniform. There are things that don't come free with universal basic education. So let's push government to provide basic services, but also come to the realization of the importance of choice and empowerment at the micro level. I think as basic income uh, advocates, we also need to realize that sometimes there can be political sabotage, that politicians may use basic income to build the numbers and get people to follow them and feel that, you know, I am driving a vision that is going to deliver Canaan into your hands. In reality, they are looking for their hope. We have to hold these politicians to account. They have to move with the advocacy for basic income, whether they win or they don't. They have to stay at the forefront, pushing for policy, whether they are looking for political seats or not, so that basic income is then not branded as a political vehicle for people who want to get power into their hands. It should be seen as an emancipation of people who lack, people who need to be cared for by those who are in positions of authority and in positions of decision making because people will soon abuse basic income. 
and then we will remain a laughing stock and we will be sucked into the political conversations which will then give us the populist attitude of people who are just looking to take adv another group looking to take advantage of disadvantaged people so i think that that for me is a really important thing that we hold decision makers policy makers politicians to account if you stand on the forefront stand for basic income now and forever we need to recruit more people we need to convert conversion and retention convert and retain advocates at all levels we need to get the basic basic services advocates to join the basic income advocates we need the basic healthcare universal basic healthcare advocates to join the basic income advocates we need real allies to help us convert and retain more and more advocates as basic income advocates we need to be tolerant because remember when you're doing advocacy small gains step by step will lead to big gains let's not say that a six month two year 10 year basic income is not a basic income we want something that will last forever let us take one step at a time and see success there is a time when no one would think about a basic income even for one month if we get people who can be there to listen to a basic income something that looks like a basic income that can run even for one year let's get those people on our side and then let's build them to be our allies to be part of the advocates to push for an even longer lasting basic income i think that would be for me the push uh, as an advocate of basic income i can't comment on the models uh, that are circulating in uk but uh, i think uh, the 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 heart of the matter are two points extremely important one is about the models i think the most important part of the very ethos of basic income is the unconditionality any scheme that has any kind of conditionality i think is not basic income basic income is unconditional it has to be unconditional if you're if you're talking about then you're talking about something else if you are imposing any kind of conditionality the, the last point i would just like to highlight here is that we have to question the accepted narratives like private inheritance i think we have taken private inheritance so much for granted and completely forgot about public inheritance i think we have to reclaim the idea of public inheritance what is it that we have inherited and how can one inventor have intellectual property rights on something for such a long time i think those are very critical questions especially i think paul and laura are thinking so much about the world basic income i think that's a very cr crucial question about how do you why should you privatize the public inheritance where in what domains are we privatizing the public uh, inheritance i think those are very crucial questions uh, we need yeah thank you thank you so much for all participants thank you to all our incredible panel members